If you would, grab your Bibles or any device in which you have a Bible app on, hold it up high and repeat after me. This is my Bible, this is my Bible. the Word of God. And inside, and inside, God tells me, God tells me the, plans the plans he has for my life. He tells me how much he loves me, <laughs> even when this world <laughs> tells me that I am not lovable. <laughs> and I shall be <laughs> all that God desires for me to be <laughs> because his Holy Spirit <laughs> dwells inside of me. <laughs> this I proclaim. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. Well, I was going to tell you to turn to a specific passage to get us going, but I'm going to need you to work your fingers today, but only in, for the most part, in one letter. But to kickstart it, and we're going to be, for the most part, in the uh, letter of Romans, but to kickstart it. I would like to say that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. So today I want to talk to you about an expedition on Romans Road, an expedition on Romans Road. And Expedition has to do with a journey or a voyage that takes place by a group of people in order to discover and to understand. And I thought that this was a fitting message um, and a fitting time for us to journey down Romans Road. And so that is what I would like to do with you uh, today. For some of you, Uh, It may be the first time that you have heard Romans Road, and so this will be a presentation to you that I pray that you will respond to by accepting Christ. For some who, for for, for the, the remainder who already know Jesus Christ, it will be like maybe a help, a tool, a resource that will help you and I present the good news to everyone else. And so because we are God's people, we have a responsibility. And so I think it's necessary that God's people who have been saved by Jesus Christ are effectively equipped in order to share the gospel with others, just as someone shared with you. And so today we're going to walk down Romans Road. There's a road uh, that uh, on an album cover, Abbey Road, that uh, the Beatles are getting ready to cross the road there in London. And I had the opportunity to stand at the corner of that road and uh, walk across the street. It's one of the most famous roads of all. Uh, And if you uh, don't Google it now, I want you to stay focused, but you can Google the Beatles uh, on one of their most famous, uh, iconic pictures that they ever took. And it became one of the most famous pictures of all time far as uh, music is concerned. Uh, But let me tell you, there's a road much uh, famous than that. It's a timeless road. It's timeless. In fact, it's a road that one, once he gets on that road, if he gets to the end of it, he will say he's glad he traveled on. That road is to be introduced to others by those who are traveling or have traveled on that road. We have a responsibility to tell people about God's good news. Well, the Romans road gives us the opportunity to share that. We're going to make a few stops on this road today. And if you don't mind, I just want to kind of get it going by sharing with you this first stop. It's Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Now, when 
you have settled there, I need you to look back at me. And I want to try to get as many people looking this way as possible. And here's, here's, here's what I want you guys to listen to me say. The good news is necessary to be shared. And before we journey down this road, I really want you to pay close attention to these verses. But I'm not sharing these verses with you because I like these verses. I love these verses, but we all should love these verses. And we all should seek to not just memorize them, but internalize them. And so I'm going to read the verse to you. And then once we're done expounding upon it before I move on, you'll read it also with me, okay, in hopes that when it's all said and done, we will actually be on the same page. So because this is so serious, I just find it necessary to do one thing. Would you bow your head for a moment? Lord, help us to memorize what we're about to look at today. Lord, I pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that every verse that we look at, that we will be able to retain it, in our mind, retain it in our heart. And dear Lord, I pray, Father, that we would just dwell on it, gnaw on it, Father, as if it was a piece of straw hanging out of our mouths that we just gnaw on, and Lord, that we think about and that we would be willing to share with others. Help us, Father, not to just see it as a uh, exercise on a Sunday morning, but dear Lord, help us to apply this to every opportunity that we're given to every person so that we could rightfully and clearly and concisely share the gospel. It's in Christ Jesus' name. I pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Romans 3, verse 23, says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This passage strongly communicates who needs salvation. Who needs salvation? I I, I was going to tell you what the Greek word, and when you take all in English and translate it to Greek, I was going to tell you what what the word is, then tell you what it means. And uh, I, I won't say the word for you, but I'll tell you what it means. All in Greek literally means all. All in Greek literally means all. All have sinned, okay? All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And I need you to know that the word gospel literally means good news, okay? It it, it means good news, but it would not be good news if there was not any bad news. Okay, so that's some bad news that preceded. And why would anyone actually uh, need to hear or need to believe uh, the gospel or believe the good news unless they understood that there was some bad news and that there was a need for this good news? And so this is where this passage in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 comes in because this passage here is a fundamental foundational reminder that All have sinned. Everyone has sinned. Listen, no one is righteous. No one. No one is good. No one. No one keeps the Ten Commandments perfectly. No one. If you want to elaborate on it, uh, just turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. No one is perfect. No one is good. All have sin. And God is holy. God is holy. And every single human being that has ever lived has come up short and does not live in perfect uh, uh, accordance or according to God's perfect standards. And so I need you to know that whether you have sinned once or whether you are watching online, from prison, serving a life sentence, I need you to know that all have sinned, whether you sinned once or whether you sin regularly, all have sinned. Everyone comes up 
short. In fact, uh, James chapter 2, verse 10 says that even if you and I have uh, a sin once, a broken one law, it's as if, as if we have broken all of the laws. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, at one point, has become guilty of all. Sin is a reality that must be recognized for us to truly understand the gospel. Everyone is a sinner. All have fallen short of God's standards. See, I'm six feet tall. If God's standards let's just say, was 10 feet. One of my favorite players I enjoy watching, he's a rookie this year. He doesn't even come up to 10 feet. He is seven foot four. He still comes up short to 10 feet. Well, God's standard is so perfect, it is so holy, that 10 feet is not even a drop in the bucket. We come up short. The most respectable person that you can think of, the person that you just think that if they sit on a rock, that a bird might land on their shoulder that a deer might come and eat out of their hand. They're just so loving and kind. Butterflies follow them everywhere they go. That person falls short. Everyone comes up short. Everyone is a sinner. And because we are sinners, that means that we are separated from having a relationship with God. And this started way back in the Garden of Eden with the downfall of Adam, who represented all of us. And fellowship was broken. The relationship between man and God was broken as sin was introduced. But this brings us to stop number two. We move from Romans 3.23 to Romans 6.23 where it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, when we take this verse and tie it back to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, which says, For we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Then that brings us to Romans 6.23. And this verse explains why we need salvation. Because the payment, the outcome for sin is death. It is death. And so when we hear this, we hear here are the consequences. It's the consequence that we have to face. Here's the outcome of being separated from God is death. It's not simply physical death because everyone will experience physical death. Everyone will experience death once. But for those who die in their sins, they will experience a second death. This second death is best described as eternal separation from God. They will not have an opportunity to have a relationship with God through Jesus at this point. They are forever separated from God. I need you to pause just for like 10 seconds. And I want you to think about every person that you work with or people that are in your family that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I want you to think about how much you love that person. 
And as you think about that person and how much you love that person, imagine them being separated from God forever. No do-overs. See, sometimes when we hear that someone has lived to be 100, we say, ooh, they lived a long time. I say that. We all, we, 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 that's amazing. But do you know 100 is nothing to eternity? Forever separated from God. That is a reality. And we really need to uh, 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 understand why there's a need for salvation. Uh, he, he, here's something I want us to think about. Death is the payoff for sin. In other words, this is about God's wrath towards sin because sin has to be dealt with. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, and Revelations chapter 21, verse 8, and Matthew chapter 13, verse 42, uh, you can go to any one of those three verses and you can understand and discover the outcome of sin, but also it addresses the literal reality of heaven and of hell. In fact, in Matthew 13, verse 42, it says, and the unrighteous will be thrown into the furnace of fire and in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus shared the story of a man who physically died unrighteous, never coming to faith in him. And this person was in hell, to put it in his proper language. He was in hell, and he pleaded for Lazarus. He pleaded for, he saw, he saw Lazarus resting in the bosom of Abraham. Could you send him over here, Lord, to just give me some water, just a drop of water on my tongue? Well, that was impossible because those who are in hell are forever separated. There's nothing you can do for them. And so if maybe you were brought up in, uh, with the background in a religion that if someone that you love dies in an unrighteous state, that you, those of us who remain, we can pray for them and pray them from purgatory, pray them out of that situation, pray them out of hell. You do not have the authority to do that. You and I do not have the power to do that. And God will not do that because God has already said he will not do that. And so where they are is a permanent place and they will be in a permanent state of weeping and gnashing of teeth, suffering. And that's why he was pleading for water, pleading for some help. And I need you to know this. I intentionally pointed out that Jesus shared this story over 2,000 years ago. I pointed it out to you because I want you to know that as we sit here today and walk down this Romans road, that that man is still probably asking, can he get a cup of water? Can I just get a drop of water? He's still there. So I really want you to think about those that we say we love because you can go out and buy someone some flowers and buy them a box of candy and write them I love you cards and say I love you and send them text messages. But one of the greatest demonstrations that you could ever do to express that you love someone is to share the gospel with them. And so the earned payment for sin is death. It's death. And so just like God has a, uh, just like we have a human court, and the human court says that if you break the law, here's the consequences. God also has a divine court. And the divine court says that if you and I, who are sinners, never accept him, that there is a court that we are going to have to come to and we will face the consequences of not choosing him. So 
That's a piece of Romans 6.23. But you know what I like about Romans 6.23? The biggest but in the Bible is in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. See, think about what it said. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but... That's a big but. The gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so notice what God does. God shifts the focus from man in his broken condition, a condition that a man, he, he, we cannot fix. We can't fix our own condition. And God shifts the attention to his son, Jesus Christ. God shifts it to none other than Christ, this great gracious gift. And he says, in him is eternal life. See, I want you to know that God does not want you and I to be separated from him. Amen. He does not want us to be separated from him in relationship and for those who have already in a relationship with him today, he does not want us to be separated from him fellowship wise. God does not want us to be separated. When God created man, God created man to be in a relationship with him and Adam sinned. And that's when this relationship between God and man was severed. Adam, by sinning, he ushered in sin. Sin caused two types of death. It brought about physical death because before then there is no data, there's no records of any death on the earth. When Adam sinned, physical death creeped in. Eventually, Adam's uh, body broke down and he died physically. But more importantly than that, when Adam sinned, immediately at the moment that Adam sinned, physical death was slowly over time, but spiritual death, it happened immediately when Adam disobeyed God. Spiritual death came in. And the Bible says that if anyone who, because we all are born and shaped in iniquity, we all are born separated from God. The Bible teaches us that if we do not accept Jesus Christ during our lifetime, that we will face eternal separation, death from God. And so I need you to know that God twisted not, but God, God, he saw fit to give us this gracious gift that is in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. And here's the beautiful thing about it. You and I no longer need a measuring tape. See, some of us have, we don't use a physical measuring tape, but some of us have tried to earn our righteousness. I'm, I'm so good to people. I give to the homeless. That gives me one foot. You know what? I'm, all, I'm always respectful of other people. That gives me another foot. Ooh, I've been in church my entire life. That gives me another foot. Ooh, you know what? I don't listen to, you know, I don't listen to no ungodly music. I only listen to all this gospel music. That gives me, oh, that gives me that. And you know what? I read my Bible every day. Also, I need y'all to know that my daddy was a pastor. I need you to know that my mama, and not just my mama, her sister too, they served both on the motherboard. I know some of y'all saying, what is the motherboard? Listen, it's not George Clinton, the mothership, okay? All right, stick with me, all right, all right. A foot. Some of you say, I serve at the church. I've been serving my entire life. Listen, I serve when other people don't show up. I do like five different things all on a Sunday at the same time. And we just keep measuring, measuring up. And you know what? Now, at one point, did someone say, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so it's all tossed away. God has given us a gift. You and I did not and cannot earn it. It cannot be passed down to you. If your mom or your dad or your grandma or someone in your family is saved, they can't pass down their salvation to you. You, you, you don't inherit that, okay? 
You cannot earn it. But I do want you to know that it has been, it's a gift. God has a gift. And God has offered this gift, but this is no ordinary gift. This gift is his son, Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The same one that Pastor Yemi was talking about last week when he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves us so much that he has given us this great gift. So Romans 6.23 says that what? The wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But that leads us to another place. It answers this question here, uh, or, or it fulfills this. It shows how God provides salvation. And we see this in Romans 5, 8. See, God demonstrates in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, at your and my worst, lowest point, I want you to know Christ knew all of our lows and our highs. Like before you and I were born, he knew our lows and our highs. And you know what? He willingly still sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. While we were yet sinners. Not, notice what the text doesn't say. It doesn't say when I had cleaned myself up. When I, I've heard many, many people say this. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, accept Christ when I get myself together. Impossible. Impossible to get yourself together. If we're waiting on that, if you're waiting on that to get yourself together, then you'll never get it together. You cannot put yourself back together. At your and my lowest, while we were the worst of the worst, the worst of the worst, Christ died for your and my sin. I, I gave you all this illustration um, before. It is no different. Uh, it's, it's several people, as I look around the room, I've had the privilege and the opportunity of doing your, your weddings and whatnot. And I can tell you there has not been one, one man that stood down in the front waiting for his bride to come down, whether the aisle or in Mary and JC's case, my backyard. <laughs> not one man stood there with his back. Man, I, I don't really want to turn around because, now don't take this the wrong way, I don't want to turn around because she was ugly last week. She was ugly yesterday, and when I turn around, guess what? She's still going to be ugly. I, I, I mean, press her face in cookie dough and make monster cookies. Listen, she was, listen, she was ugly. No man I ever seen says, I, I don't want to look. No, I want you to know the Bible describes the church as the bride. Now, now it, listen, the bride ain't pretty. Listen, we come with all our brokenness, our flaws, our imperfection. We come with all of our lies, our gossiping, uh, our sexual immorality, all of these perverted and, uh, and, and just, just dirty, low down, filthy stuff. That's the bride. And the groom, he doesn't say, mm, mm. He turns around. Watch this. The groom, I have to tell the groom to stay there and just wait for the bride to come down. But the groom, Jesus, oh, with your ugly self. Hey, he says, I'm coming. I'm, with our ugly self, he says, I'm coming. He, he comes to, listen, he loves us while we were at our worst. And the reality is, guess what? He knows he has to come to us because we don't even have the strength to make it down the aisle. And sometimes the church act like we're doing Jesus a favor. 
God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I, I, I want you to understand that when we were unlovable, God loved us. When we were hopeless, God gave us hope. God loves you and I. If you're in this room and you think no one loves you, or if you've been told repeatedly throughout your life that you are not lovable, no one wants you, I need you to know that's a lie. It's a lie that the devil wants you to embrace, but it's not the reality of God. God loves you, and I don't care what you have done or what you do. There is nothing, nothing possible, as the Bible says, that can separate you and I from the love of God. God loves you and I. But that brings us to Romans Eight, one. But in order to get there, I want to make sure you understand that in Romans 5, 8, who demonstrated this love? God. And he did this while we were yet sinners. And Christ dying for us. And it brings us to Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now. No condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Uh, listen, this is some really good news, okay? This is some really good news. It means that those who have put their faith in Christ, you put your faith in him, the Bible says that you do not have to walk around in guilt or shame any longer. You and I just have to come to that reality. If you and I have put our faith, our trust in him, believing in the fact that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for you and my sins, that he rose from the dead on the third day, the Bible says that we will be saved. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4 says it like this. Paul is making this statement. Check out this gospel, how this good news. For I hand it down to you as of first importance. What I also received that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Oh, yeah. Listen, he died. He was buried. But he got up. That's the good news. The Bible says that if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, the one whom the good news is all about, the Bible says that we will be saved and that there is no condemnation. You and I will not go to hell. Amen. Hell is a literal place, but you and I will not go to hell. Once you have believed in Jesus Christ, once, just one time, you and my sins have been washed away. There's no such thing as, well, you know, the brother was kind of saved. Well, he was almost saved. She was a little saved. You're either saved or unsaved. Your sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. And as the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Oh, yeah. The blood of Jesus. So Jesus did it for us. And when we put our faith in him, we are born again. But this brings us to the final stop. And before I get to this final stop, I want you to walk with me for a second. Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. When you're sharing the gospel with someone, hey, share this with them. All have sinned. 
to fall short of the glory of God. Do you know that there are some people that admire you and they see your walk in Christ and they think that cannot be a reality for them? But you remind them, no, when I say all have sinned, my sister, my brother, that means me too. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Also, as Christians, I think we should be a, a, a more responsible in sharing with people that we are imperfect people, that God is perfected. I, I, I think sometimes the church gets the reputation of being a hypocrite because the church does not do a good job of communicating that I am being perfected. If I told you God is working on me, you may have a lot more patience with me than if I told you I'm already done. There's a, there's a lot more grace and mercy uh, that Pastor Yemi and Sarah show their daughter because she's such a young age. But, that, but, but they won't show that same grace when she's 15. You know better. If you tell people that you have already arrived, I'm, I'm done. I don't, I don't have any growing to do. If that's the message that you're communicating, then why would they not call you a hypocrite? Because if you got it all together, then why is it falling all apart? So the church has to do a better job of communicating that we are being perfected. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But that brings us to how God brought this about. And that brings us to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Because God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then that brings us to this sweet reality in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is absolutely uh, no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. And now, it brings us to Romans 10, verses 9 through 10 and verse 13. It says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And then in verse 13, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what we discover from these verses is how we receive salvation and the results of salvation. This is where the rubber actually meets the road. The question comes down to, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that he is the son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead on the third day? It comes down to, are you willing to confess your sin and accept the bad news that you and I are spiritually bankrupt without God's help? It comes down to, are you willing to accept the good news that God has made a way for you and I to have a relationship with him and be saved from the penalty of sin, which is his wrath? See, it's only through faith in Christ Jesus that God's power can change you and I. As I look around the room, I'm blessed to know many people who are enjoying a relationship with Christ Jesus. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're making it known to others. Then there may be some in this room today who do not know Christ Jesus as your Lord. I want you to prepare to respond to it. I, I, I want you to respond to the gospel. I, I want to see you thrive in the relationship that God designed for you and I. God designed for you and I to be in a rightful relationship with him. That's how God had in intended for it to be. For those of us who already know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have to really take advantage of every opportunity that we're given to share the gospel. I oftentimes hear pastors say, and I said it many, many, many times, and I'm wrong, and they are too. Sometimes we say, Lord, if you give me the opportunity, I'll share the gospel. Sometimes we say to people, uh, you know, if the opportunity ever comes, 
to share the gospel. It is impossible if you're in this room to be uh, 70 years old and never had the opportunity. I need you to know that if you're in this room and you're 50 years old, it is impossible for you to have never had the opportunity to share the gospel. I need you to know that if you're in this room and you're 25 years old, it is impossible that you have not been given the opportunity to share the gospel. I want you to know that if you're 15 years old, that it is impossible for you to not have had the opportunity to share the gospel. If you're 10 years old, it is impossible for you to not have had the opportunity to share the gospel because wherever people are, there is an opportunity to share the gospel. Sometimes people say, if I, if I get a chance and just kind of, if I, if I can sit down over lunch with that person or sit down over, uh, have a cup of coffee with the person. Let me tell you, I'm not asking you, have you led someone to Christ? Sharing the gospel and someone accepting are two different things. You and I cannot save anyone, but we are given the responsibility of sharing the gospel. And if you share the gospel today, when you leave this church, you, you Listen, and don't say, I, well, I don't know if I'm going to have the opportunity. If you stop at Walmart, Publix, or Piggly Wiggly's, you had the opportunity. If you stop at Home Depot, you had the opportunity. If your car is in the shop, whether you're dropping it off or picking it up, you've had the opportunity. Listen, I, 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 Pastor JC, we, we were trying to get, I was trying to get a video to show you. Uh, this past Wednesday, I was at a home going service for uh, one of my aunts. And she, she passed away. And four years ago, they told her that she had like a month to live, a month or two to live from this cancer. And do you know, what did she do in response? Instead of just wallowing in her sorrows, she called all of the young people, not just from her church, but every young person that has ever grew up in the church that I grew up in. I'm talking about she was calling Everyone. And she had a church filled with generations down. And she only had two messages for them all. They came together. Everyone was coming out of love. They thought they was coming to tell her goodbye. And she had two things to tell them. And young people, you listen to me closely. She told, she said, young people, don't be discouraged from coming to church because of things you have heard or seen from other people. Don't be discouraged from coming to church because someone hurt your feelings and whatnot. Don't turn on the thing, turn your back on the things of God because of people. But a most important message was, you all need Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you need Jesus. And she said, don't worry about me. I'm okay. I fixed it with Jesus a long time ago. I just wanted you guys to come together because I, I love God and I love you all so much that I wanted my last words to be that I want you to know Jesus Christ. But hold up. She wasn't done. She didn't, listen, she didn't physically die. She lived another four years. And then about two weeks ago, I got a call from, a, a, a message from one of my uh, mom's sisters. She said, hey, Aunt Trish is in the hospital. They're calling all the family in. And I made it there early in the morning. I took my Bible in and I opened up John chapter 14. And I started to read to her. But let me tell you something. She didn't die right away. God gave her strength and she cut a video. She cut this video telling everybody she's okay. She's okay and she's ready to go, but I want y'all to know Jesus. She did that from her hospital bed while she was dying. Listen, that's how, as a believer, that's how I want to see us all be. Like to the last moment, tell people about Jesus. Every opportunity that you get. In fact, in my hand, I'm going to, listen, listen, this, 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 this. Uh, the altar is open, but I, I want you to know that if you already know Jesus Christ, you say you're looking for an opportunity. How many of you in this room actually have a dog? You, do you own a dog? Do you own a dog? Do you own a dog? All right. Uh, listen, do you go to the park sometimes? Every once in a while, out in the yard. Okay, listen, if you want to see me, I have some dog snacks. 
No, these dog snacks are not for you to open up an opportunity to share the gospel with the dog. But I would love to give you these dog snacks that were given to me by a friend in the church. I asked her, could I use them? But would you be at a park, the park you go to with your dog, and you see someone walking their dog, how about you strike up a conversation with them and ask would they like some dog snacks for their dog? And maybe it'll open up the opportunity for you to share the gospel with the person. I got someone that said, man, I missed out on that one. I got another dog snack for you. Listen, someone else, I got another dog snack for you. Listen, what my point is, use every opportunity, and I know this work. I did this in Canada at a park, and people there were walking their dogs, and we just stood in the park, and I was giving out snack. People love their dogs, they love talking. And, and I switched the conversation from a dog to you. You and God. And so, see me out, see me out. I'm, I'm serious, y'all think I'm kidding about this. I don't care how you do it. You can use an Easter egg, you can use a, a doggy treat. I don't care how you do it, but we're given opportunities all the time to share the gospel. And those who already know Jesus Christ, we should be sharing it. And so with that being said, the altar is open for prayer. Maybe you just need encouragement, uh, strength. Maybe you just say, Lord, uh, these opportunities that I'm given, help me, Father, not to be in fear because I don't have to rely on my boldness. All I have to do is what you call me to do and you will provide the boldness. Why don't you just come down to the altar? Maybe you have a decision that you need to make because you recognize that you are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those opportunities are here for you. There's a decision card on the back of the seat in front of you, but there's also counselors here to help you navigate through this journey where you have recognized I do not know Jesus Christ, but today I accept him. And for those who already know, maybe, just maybe, you just want to pray and ask God to lay upon your heart and your mind those that you're going to share the gospel with today and throughout the week. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for your word, your ever-changing word, your ever-living word. And Lord, we ask, Father, that you would just fill us up with your Holy Spirit. Help us, Father, to have eyes that seek those who are lost. Help us, Father, to go before them and share the gospel with clarity and, Father, in a concise way. And, Lord, help us, oh, Lord, help us, oh, Lord, to make sure that all honor, all glory is given to you and help us not to focus upon the fact if they accept or not, but just help us, Father, to be willing to do what you've called us to do, and that is to share the good news. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.